Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. This is Jane. She thinks she's just filling her car, but she's also filling the air with cancer-causing toxic chemicals used to boost octane and gas. What doesn't burn in the engine enters the air and your lungs, even your heart and brain. Bad for everyone, especially kids. Ethanol is a natural octane booster, clean burning and non-toxic. More ethanol means less scary stuff in our gas and in the air we breathe. And that makes your choice pretty plain. Jane, American Ethanol, cleaner air for Nebraska. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. On this episode, Darren Newsom looks at strength in corn and soybean exports. Shane Ellis describes pork and beef production. Greg Ibaugh talks about results from a Nebraska farm financial survey. And Tamara Jackson Zims explains how growers can select seed corn varieties to help manage diseases. DTN senior analyst Darren Newsom is our corn and soybean market analyst this week. It's been a newsworthy couple of weeks for oil and gasoline. First, the Environmental Protection Agency finalized its 2017 requirements of the Renewable Fuel Standards, setting a 15 billion gallon mark for conventional ethanol. Second, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC, reportedly reached a deal to limit output. That sent prices soaring early Wednesday. We talked with Darren Wednesday afternoon and began by asking about implications of a possible production cut. Uh, the biggest implication to me is just to see how long this actually lasts. Um, you know, we saw a four-dollar plus rally in the market on uh, on Wednesday, uh, shortly after the announcement was made, and you know everything's all excited. The headlines came out, the computers kicked in, the buying went crazy. It tried to carry over into some of the other commodity markets, but the rest of them just realized it just had nothing to do with them. So, you know, we haven't done. It hasn't created any huge changes on the long-term charts. And a few months down the road, it'll be interesting to see how many of these competing countries are actually living up to these new agreements or these new production cuts. I'm obviously facing it with a little bit of skepticism. Uh, I don't know that it's going to last. It could. Uh, if it does, crude oil is going to probably get back up in the 50s. And uh, you know that could certainly help out some commodity sectors, but probably not going to have a huge effect on many others. The RFS news on uh, on corn and soybeans, or at least the resulting impact from biodiesel and ethanol, do you think that has a, a big impact on the market, or could it have a big impact on the market? You know, the biggest thing is, is that it shows that we still have solid demand. You know, something that we have to have. We have to have that constant demand, which is ethanol for corn. At this time when we continue to increase production, we have to have, you know, export demand is iffy. Uh, feed demand comes and goes. Uh, it looks like we're on the upswing with that again. But ethanol demand has been constant. We have to have that. Now on the biodiesel side, it's really interesting. We've got a smoking hot uh, global oil seed market right now. And this plays into that. You know, we've got Malaysian palm oil just skyrocketing higher. We've got canola going to new highs. It's starting to leak over into the bean oil market. And that could help support soybeans as well. Some of it's biodiesel, some of it's used, most of it's just used for food products and so on. So, Yes, I think that's going to continue to provide support to the market, but I think there's some outside things that are actually going to pull that could actually have more influence on the bean complex. Can you describe more on the export market specifically for corn and soybeans, what it looks like? Right now, it's running really strong. Uh, we're running well ahead of expectations uh, on sales and on shipments. For total sales for both corn and soybeans, we're running well ahead of what USDA has projected in November. 
Now the question I have is a lot of this being done, particularly on the sales side, ahead of the inauguration in January. Is there some fear out there among some of our key trading partners that things could change come January? Also, interest rates are going to start going up, almost guaranteed in December, and we're expected to see another three, four increases over the next year. That's going to make U.S. goods more uh, more expensive on the global market as well. So. I'm, you know, it just looks like we're seeing a lot of this buying now ahead of these sorts of things. I'm interested in what happens to our sales once we've come and gone, once December's come and gone, once January's come and gone, if we don't fall off the map at that point. And that would certainly be the time that South America comes back into play. That's the biggest thing. Yes, South American crop, late February, early March is when it's going to be ready and start to come in and start to become a factor in the global export market. Now. One thing that could throw that off a little bit is if we have some weather issues in South America. Uh, planting, from the last numbers I saw is going along, some, most areas are running a little bit ahead of schedule, you know, but it's always very dicey. You know, we get into this time of year, weather becomes a key concern down in South America. So there's going to be a lot of volatility over the course of the winter for that reason, because I think the world is, is counting on better production, out, you know, particularly in the corn market, uh, in Brazil this year, so this doesn't have to be completely reliant on U.S. supplies. Tell me what your price forecast looks like for corn and soybeans. You know, it's, it's difficult. Um, as a technical analyst, if I throw out the fundamentals and say, you know, if I just look at the long-term charts, it looks like we've got some room to go up. You know, theoretically, soybeans could get to 11. You know, if soybeans get to 11, it would make sense that we could push, you know, $4 and beyond in corn. Fundamentally, there's no way you can make those arguments. You know, they probably shouldn't be priced where they are right now. Uh, you know, around the $10 mark in soybeans and you know, upper threes in corn might be the best that it can do. So, I think it's going to lead to a very interesting winter. Uh, this price relationship between corn and soybeans, I think, it's going to reset what we're looking at for acreage next year. It's going to be tough. You know, to really put your finger on a, on a hard and fast price target, I don't know that you can do that. You're going to have to be able to, to move with the market, you're going to have to be very flexible. I think it can go up. I think we'll see some sort of winter rally. It's just going to, have, it's just going to be difficult to maintain any momentum because of the overall supplies. Will you talk more about that acre number that you said you think it could be? A, a... You know, the, the early thought is, is that we're going to see this, this large switch from mm -hmm. corn to soybeans. You know, last year we added 6 million acres of corn after we already had too much corn from the previous year. So now we're sitting there staring at a 2.4 billion bushel carryout going into 2017-18. Uh, or at least that's what's projected right now. So now the talk is that we're going to back corn off 3, 4, 5 million acres and we're going to add 3, 4, 5 million acres to soybeans and possibly even pull some wheat acres over into soybeans. All of this is very possible, but if we start adding 5, 6 million acres to soybeans next year, at a time when we already supposedly are going to have large ending stocks, I don't buy that, uh, and, and South America is supposed to have record crops, it's going to be tough for soybeans in 2017. Again, that's a lot to have play out. We saw the same scenario last year, and it didn't happen. So all this early talk that we're going to see this huge switch from corn to soybeans, let's see how it plays out, because what we've proven year in and year out is that the U.S. likes to grow corn. Until proven otherwise, I think we're going to probably stick with that. Next week, Mike Briggs will join us to look at cattle markets. Our livestock panelist at this week's Market Journal Roadshow was Iowa State Extension livestock economist Shane Ellis. Shane discussed margins for farmers and ranchers producing pork and beef and the current level of overall production. Through the first 10 months of the year, U.S. commercial beef production was 5% higher than the same time span in 2015, and the country's total pork output was up 1%. As Shane noted, those industries will need to find extra demand to help consume both meats. The foreign market has been brighter, with beef exports in September up 30% from a year ago, and pork shipments during the third quarter 5% higher than that period in 2015. We talked with Shane in Kearney and began by looking at the current levels of production. Looking at where we've been you know, compared to what we were in the past and everything, we're producing beef at levels that we probably haven't done since like 2010, before the drought, really. I mean, we've really done a good job of that heifer retention and kind of moving things around. We're seeing that happen now with a number of cattle that are going into slaughter in our production. While our slaughter weights are a little bit lower, 
No, we're going to expect that to happen. We have a tremendous number of animals going into the market right now. USDA is looking at beef production up about 4.4 percent coming into the next year. You said today one of the things that's going to have to happen is there's going to have to be more demand from somewhere. Let's talk about the international market. What have we seen so far? Well, we've had a very good uh, a run so far in the last five years. We've seen beef exports of about 10 percent of what we've been, been producing. So while we were going through that period of producing less, we were actually still continuing to maintain some very strong exports during the time that our beef was the most expensive. Now while our beef is getting a little bit cheaper, particularly on the, at the live animal sector, we're hoping to find some additional markets for that. We're looking at maybe China being a potential rising market. That's a market that has been closed to U.S. beef since 2003. So 13 years later, we might be getting in there. That's kind of a growing market. Huge population, lots of middle class folks that might have a taste for high quality U.S. beef. Touch on pork. You mentioned today just how important or just how much we export each year. How important are those uh, export markets? We're quite dependent on our exports for the disappearance and utilization of the, of the pork that we're producing. In the last uh, well, eight years, we've seen an increase in that uh, uh, exports of our pork. In the last five years, it's been between 20 and 22 percent of the pork that's produced in the United States has been exported. That's like all the pork produced in the whole state of Iowa, all dependent on being exported. If for some reason something were to happen to suddenly shut that down and all that were to come back on our market, we would see some catastrophic price drops out there just because that's a lot of pork for us suddenly to have to consume back on this market. So we are very observant of what happens on those pork exports. It's a major portion of the demand that we are supplying. We know when we talk about trade, the strength of the dollar comes into play. It's at its strongest mark or around that level in more than a decade. Uh, what do you think will happen here as we close out the year, factoring in a potential interest rate hike in December? Well, it's usually very nice to be able to say, man, we got a good, strong U.S. dollar, strong indication of where our standing in the world is and our economy is strong. But it tends to be a little bit of a wet towel for our exports, especially for the ag exports. And so we're going to see a little bit of pressure. That's, it's not really a positive thing. If we have a weak U.S. dollar, cheapens up our export. Other countries say, hey, it's a bargain to buy U.S. products, particularly China. China is one of those that they love a bargain. So as the U.S. dollar does become stronger as we go through time, that's making our products more expensive to these other countries. It could be something, not saying it's going to shut it down or anything like that, but it's going to dampen or push back against any growth that we're hoping to see happen in the coming years. I want to come full circle on this. We talked about production to start off with. Where do you think these industries, both pork and beef, are going in terms of expansion or contraction over the next couple of years? On the pork side, I think these guys are going to continue to have a very controlled expansion. A lot of that has to do with just their efficiencies. They're constantly becoming more and more efficient. We're producing more pigs per litter, healthier pigs growing faster, and we're doing a very good job with that. On the beef side of things, we'll see how profitability happens in the cow-calf sector. Right now, we've come in off of a period of six strong years of profitability into a year of pretty low profitability now with 2016 and 17 might be the same thing happen again. We'll see how much of a dampener that is on the cow-calf sector because that is the engine of the industry. You want to ramp up production, you got to get the cow-calf sector excited. We're suddenly seeing some of that excitement moving back out of that sector. A lot of folks are saying, you know, how can I expand things uh, right now because I need to sell every single heifer just to cover my costs. It's awful hard to grow that industry if you aren't continuing to see that heifer retention happening. What we retain right now for heifers, that doesn't turn into additional supply for another two years. Regarding current inventory levels, the USDA is scheduled to release its next quarterly hogs and pigs report on December 23rd. On January 31st, it'll release its count of all cattle and calves in the country. It'll be the agency's only estimate on those numbers in a year. Market Journal's partners for this year's Roadshow were UNL's Department of Agricultural Economics and the Nebraska Department of Agriculture. The major focus for the events was on how producers could better navigate the current farm economy. The expectations for this year were highlighted Wednesday when the USDA lowered its U.S. net farm income forecast to $66.9 billion. That would be a 17% drop from 2015. 
Nebraska Department of Ag Director Greg Ibaugh regularly talks with us on Market Journal about the international efforts of the NDA, but he joined us at the Roadshow this week to describe the results of a survey focused on farm finances in Nebraska. We talked with him in Kearney about the purpose of that study. Earlier this year, we knew uh, even in the spring that farmers and ranchers were looking at lower commodity prices going into the fall. We knew that um, a lot of farmers and ranchers had uh, purchased real estate, purchased farm equipment, and had bid up cash rents in their, uh, in their neighborhoods as part of the strong farm prices. And so, um, you know, based on my experience in production agriculture, I knew that that kind of was the formula or the ingredients for financial stress. And so we uh, and the Department of Agricultural Economics uh, worked together to do a survey to kind of gauge just how deep or how concerned individual producers were this summer. What did the results show based on the questions about how much stress they were under? So what the results of the survey showed was that uh, you know, in the young and beginning farmer categories, which we've had a pretty strong return to the farm during the good uh, farm financial uh, period, mm -hmm. that uh, those producers were a little bit more concerned about what the downturn in prices meant. Many of them, uh, you know, were the people that uh, had to rent the land that uh, w was competition, increased those rental rates. Uh, many of those uh, maybe purchased real estate or equipment to enhance their family operation to allow them to expand and come home as well. And so uh, they, they were probably the most concerned in the survey. Some of our more experienced or longer term established farmers and ranchers, not as concerned. Uh, they uh, were confident that they would be able to weather the storm. What are the things that they were thinking about doing in the future to try to better position themselves financially? So I think that's you know part of the result of uh, coming out now with the, mark, the road show having a strong element of uh, managing for the future as well as uh, working with Extension and the Department of Ag Economics to look at what we offer from a department point of view with farmers that may be experiencing some financial stress as well as what they can do to help farmers manage that, but look at things like inputs, family living expenses, and you know, how do you uh, work with your banker to structure your debt to fit your, uh, your income. You know, a lot of, you know, when we had high farm income, a lot of uh, machinery and equipment that might have been put as an intermediate term debt was rolled into the current debt. Maybe if we reconfigure the, the way the debt's structured, that will help us better operate into the future. What programs does NDA have that you think farmers and ranchers should be aware of or young farmers and ranchers should be aware of? Well, we definitely have, uh, you know, if they're f uh, experiencing financial stress, we have the mediation program, which uh, many bankers embrace the opportunity to sit down together and work proactively with a third party to help find solutions. But you know, in some of our young uh, beginning farmer uh, tax credit programs, if they were participants in that, uh, a component of that had to do with uh, financial management, and so hopefully that helps some of those uh, uh, farmers. You know, I think ours are more uh, the programs that the department has are more extreme. Uh, you know, for those extreme cases that maybe have gone farther. You know, we're hoping by partnering with the university to take what we have available and enhance it with, with what they can do through extension to help manage it ahead of it becoming a big problem. You can find more information about the study Greg mentioned through a link on the Market Journal website. The December Nebraska farmer says Guy Mills Jr.'s great-grandpa used to have a saying, never underestimate a young man with his back against the wall. This month's issue says times may be tough in the farm economy, but Mills sees that as an opportunity. For Mills, who farms near Ansley, it's all about turning data into knowledge and building confidence in decision making. You can read about the steps he uses to plan ahead and manage his farming operation in the December Nebraska Farmer. 
As a whole, the 2016 growing season will end up as the best ever for the country. The overall outputs and average yields for corn and soybeans in the U.S. will break records, according to the agency's November projections. January's annual crop production report will put the final cap on harvest numbers, but as of the latest estimates, Nebraska's corn farmers will harvest the third largest crop in the nation with an average yield of 184 bushels per acre. However, as we discussed during the year, producers battled numerous now familiar diseases and one confirmed for the first time ever in the U.S. Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Tamara Jackson Zims joined us recently to discuss how seed corn selection might be able to help growers manage some of those issues. We started by asking for a recap of what they saw in 2016. Well, we, we certainly did have quite a few diseases in corn this past year. Some of them were the usual suspects and a few other newer things that people aren't as accustomed to. And it took some people by surprise and in some cases may have impacted yield more than they were expecting to. So how effective can seed corn selection be in trying to manage these diseases? Well, in, in recent years, we've been much more fortunate that our seed companies have identified many more resistant hybrids to some of the major diseases that we have here in Nebraska and elsewhere. And so that gives us an opportunity to select hybrids ahead of time and position them in fields where we know we've had a history of some of these diseases because the pathogens that cause most of these diseases over winter and that guarantees we're likely to see them again if weather conditions are favorable. Tell me specifically which diseases you can look for or look to manage with seed corn selection. Well we do have hybrids that um, have good resistance to things like Goss's bacterial wilt and blight and gray leaf spot and now we have resistance to other diseases too like some of our common stalk rot diseases like anthracnose and that was a big problem in 2016 as well as now this is a more recent changes, we have resistance now to some southern rust too, and that hasn't happened uh, historically, and so now we have a better chance of fighting some of these diseases and sometimes reducing input costs. How effective can variety selection be when it comes to managing rust? Mm. So we had a lot of southern rust in some parts of Nebraska last year. Some of it was quite severe and came on very quickly there at the end of the season. Well. Rust pathogens don't overwinter on corn in Nebraska or in the, in the temperate climates. And so they're not predictable in where they're gonna develop because the spores have to blow in every year. But fortunately, we do have hybrids now with more resistance to southern rust. And so uh, it seems like we're seeing more and more rust, a little bit every year at least. And so now we do have an option, especially in those southern counties where we seem to see it more consistently. So should you look at it differently on your operation in terms of high risk areas or areas that you're going to plant first or areas that have lodging problems? Tell me how you mm -hmm. want people to look at this as they go about their seed corn selection. Well, certainly we have high risk production situations. And in many cases where we have uh, pathogens that overwinter in crop debris, we have uh, situations where uh, continuous corn, minimum till, might put us at greater risk for disease development. And so in those situations, it would be especially important if you're coming back to corn again to make sure and position a resistant hybrid there. Although crop rotation is still one of our best pest management strategies. Some people are still using tillage, although that is not going to be applicable in every situation. We saw a bacterial leaf streak in a lot of areas across the state this year. Is there anything producers can do to try to manage that problem? Well, bacterial leaf streak was reported for the first time in the United States this year, and we have quite a bit of it spread across parts of Nebraska. At this time, we don't have any commercially available hybrids that are resistant to it that we know of. Some may react better than others. And so again, I would go back to your seed agronomist and have a discussion about what would be the best approach and which ones to position there. Otherwise, we've been using general management recommendations coming back to that crop rotation and in, in rare cases, maybe tillage. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist, Al Dutcher. Well, folks, here we begin for the weekly forecast. And of course, during this last week, the major topic was this big storm system that moved from the western United States into the central plains and then eventually lifted up into the northern plains. Gave us some scattered shower activity both in the west and the east with a more concentrated precipitation located in central to northeastern Nebraska. Uh, we're welcoming the precipitation. Thankfully, we missed out on the vast majority of the snowfall. That heaviest snowfall fell across the Dakotas with portions of north central and south central North Dakota 
with a three-day total approaching 18 inches. And we've heard some isolated pockets over two foot that were reported. And that leaves a fairly decent foundation of snowfall to our north. So anytime the winds come out of the north, we're going to have to come over that snowpack, and that's going to keep a lid on our maximum temperatures. Farther to our east, we had the devastating fires in the southeastern United States. The cold front with this storm system moved through that region. We did see one small pocket of four plus inch totals in central Kentucky and Tennessee into northern Mississippi. Unfortunately, it missed most of the region that was devastated by the heavy fire activity, particularly the Gatlinburg area. And unfortunately, most of that region received less than an inch and a half of precipitation, was expected to receive well over three inches. So we're going to need to see a couple more storm systems before we are to see any major improvements in the drought in that region. For us, we're looking at a storm system that will be coming out next week. And as we go to the upper models, we'll take a look at what's going on presently. We have this ridge in place to our rest and a sl slight trough that is moving through the region. So we are bringing the cooler air as it remains to the north as opposed to the central plains. And we'll see that trough starting to move into our region. So we're going to start to see winds coming out of a more southerly direction. And we'll see a bright, brief warm up, but this trough really starts to take shape as we go into the early part of next week. And we'll start to lift energy up into the central plains. And we do have the uh, idea that there will be some snow accumulation someplace in, in Nebraska before the system really gets cranked up as it moves toward the upper Great Lakes region as we get later in the week and develop a very strong storm system over the upper Great Lakes region. And as that system moves to our east, we'll start to see ridging taking place late in the week before yet another system starts to approach the Pacific Northwest and we'll start to drive energy on a regular basis through our region. It looks like the models are projecting about one storm every three days, although with this zonal flow, we're not expecting a huge storm system, but things can change rather dramatic. So it looks like we are in an active weather patterns, to say the least, for the month of December. Now, in terms of precipitation, the storm system expected to come out this weekend will primarily be one in the Gulf Coast region. We'll be waiting for this main system to come down the western United States and then start to make its way into the central plain. So some of the energy from the system starts to lift toward the north, and it combines with the system out of the southwest to generate some accumulating snowfall as we get into the midweek to late week period. That will lift up to the upper Great Lakes region, and once again, another round of storms will start to move from the western United States and start to make its way into the interior region, only to hit us as we get into around the 15th of the month. So as we look at temperatures for the 8 to 14 day forecast, that takes us from next Thursday to the following Tuesday. The cold air remains in place. Most of the warmth or above normal temperatures remains well to our southeast. And in terms of precipitation, with the active flow pattern coming from west to east, we are going to see a series of storms moving across the northern half of the United States. So it looks like we're going to see normal to above normal precipitation at least for the next uh, week to week and a half. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean prices, livestock markets, farm finances in Nebraska, and seed corn selection. Thanks to everyone who attended one of the Market Journal road shows this week. We'll show you more interviews from those events in coming episodes. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Next week, Mike Briggs will look at cattle markets and Tina Barrett will discuss farm spending and costs of production. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.